Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is the COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for Tuesday, February the 16th. We'll providing, be providing written briefings tomorrow, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, and then uh, we'll be in person providing an in-person briefing on Friday. On Thursday, in addition to uh, the regular briefing on uh, long-term care home and assisted living outbreaks, we'll be providing detailed information on the level of immunizations in care homes across British Columbia. That's on Thursday. And uh, with that, it's my honour, uh, recognizing that we're on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. It's my honour to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you and good afternoon. So uh, today being the Tuesday after a long weekend, we have four periods to report on today. Um, between Friday and Saturday, we had uh, 452 new cases of COVID-19 diagnosed in British Columbia from Saturday to Sunday, an additional 431 new cases. Uh, between Sunday and Monday, 348 uh, people were diagnosed with COVID-19. In the last 24 hours, we've had an additional 302 new cases. That uh, is a total of 1,533 new cases diagnosed over the long weekend, six of whom were epidemiologically linked. And that brings our total number of uh, people diagnosed with COVID-19 to 74,283 in British Columbia. Um, of the new cases, 392 are people who reside in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 856 are people in Fraser Health Region, 58 people uh, reside on Vancouver Island, 92 are in the Interior Health Region, and 135 people were diagnosed in the Northern Health Region. We now have 4,189 active cases in all health authorities in British Columbia, of whom 231 people are in hospital, 74 of whom are in critical care or ICU. And an additional 7,136 people are under active public health monitoring, and 68,705 have now fully recovered. Over this past four days, we've had another 26 people across British Columbia who've died from COVID-19, bringing the total number of people to 1,314. As always, we know this is such a challenging and difficult time for families, for caregivers, and for communities to lose loved ones to this virus. And our condolences are with you, and our thoughts are with you today. We have three new healthcare outbreaks to report today at uh, Eden Gardens, at Wexford Creek, and at Shaughnessy Care Centre. Um, as well, we have three outbreaks that have been declared over at Heritage Square, at Concord by the Sea, and Holy Family Hospital. So we now have 15 active outbreaks in long term care and assisted living, and six in the acute care units. Um, involving 561 residents and 349 staff. In the community, we've had an additional uh, outbreak uh, declared at uh, Timothy Christian School in Chilliwack, and we've had uh, an outbreak as well at uh, SFU Child Care Society. And Fraser Health is involved with investigating and managing both of those. Uh, an update today on our variants of concern. Uh, to date, we've had a total of 60 um, people who've been infected with variants of concern. That's 40 of the B117 associated with the UK, 19 people who've been diagnosed with the B1351 variant, uh, that's originally associated with South Africa, and one person, uh, as I mentioned last week, who has the B1. Uh, 525 variant that's been uh, first detected in Nigeria. And when we talked about it last week, it was one that was 
called a variant under investigation as the, they were still uh, discussing uh, nationally and internationally whether there were some uh, of the changes, the mutations that this variant had that might confer an advantage in terms of transmission. Um, and as of today, it has been noted as a variant of concern because of some of the mutations uh, that are involved. Um, since the start of our immunization program, we're now up to 171,755 doses of a vaccine that have been administered in BC, and 22,914 of those are people who received a, a second dose as well. As we know, the past couple of weeks have been very limited in terms of supply, and we're um, really pleased to say that this week deliveries of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine are resuming. Some has arrived already, and more will be arriving in the coming days. There has been some short delays uh, because of weather, both in the United States and across Canada. But this is encouraging. Our supply still remains somewhat limited, and we need to continue to build up our program program as more supply comes in and we have more stability in the arrival of the vaccine over the coming um, couple of weeks and into March. We are focused really on providing the second doses, particularly to those people who are at highest risk, which are our residents and seniors in long-term care. I know that uh, many people have had questions about uh, what deferring the second dose for a period of time may mean for how well the vaccine works or vaccine effectiveness. And really, we've been following this, of course, very carefully in countries that started their immunization programs ahead of us and looking at the data that's been collected from the UK, from Israel, and from here in Canada. And we have some uh, early data from our long-term care homes here in British Columbia. We have some data that we've looked at over the weekend from Quebec, uh, along with fellow, uh, with our, my colleagues. And there's evidence from the WHO and others showing that this delay of several weeks between the first, the priming dose of these vaccines and the second dose, which is a booster dose, does not have a negative impact on vaccine effectiveness. What this means is that as our body is building up antibodies and, and our immune response is building uh, after the first dose, that that is sustained for a period of weeks. It may, in fact, and we know this from other vaccine programs and from how our immune system works, result in the end in a stronger and more long-lasting protection. Vaccines uh, stimulate our immune system in several ways, but there's two main parts to our immune system that are, uh, that are stimulated when we receive an immunization. First, the vaccine triggers what we call antibodies. And these antibodies are the things that bind to that protein on the outside of the virus, the spike protein, and prevent it from binding to our cells and getting into our body and, and being able to replicate. And that is what we see first. We see these antibodies increase over a period of, of days to weeks after we're immunized. It's one of the things that we can measure most easily because we can measure what we call neutralizing antibodies or the antibodies that have actually affect that spike protein in the blood. And it's something that we know um, is a marker of how well we are protected from infection. But there's also a part of our immune system called the cellular immune system. So these are things that are cells that are in our blood and what are called B cells and T cells. And these are cells that live in our lymph node and in our blood system. And they take time to fully develop. And they also uh, modify and they react and, uh, to the things like this, the protein on the outside of the virus. And it's these cells that take longer to build up but are longer lasting as well. The memory of these, uh, these antigens in the, the, the T cells and B cells, our cell mediated immunity, is what protects us over the long term. And we know from um, immunology, we know from other vaccine programs, that having a longer interval between your priming dose and your booster dose allows those cells to develop as well and may be the reason why we have a more longer lasting benefit if we have a, a longer gap between the first and the, the second dose. 
it is still too early for us to know how long this initial immunity lasts in people. But we do know that the current vaccines are very effective and the data from around the world shows us that this, uh, this protection does last for many weeks. Here in BC, we've been uh, monitoring residents of long-term care homes and have been connecting them to people who have um, developed COVID-19. And what we've seen is that in the three weeks after the, the uh, initial vaccine and long-term care residents, the protective effect of the virus is 89%, almost 90%. So that is really good news for all of us. And it supports the fact that we have good protection even after a single dose. As a scientist and somebody who's worked in the field of, of vaccines for quite a long time, this is actually incredibly exciting and positive news that we have this very high level of protection in seniors here in BC from this first dose of the vaccine. And we do know that these immediate and positive results are, are something that we rarely see with vaccine programs. And it is good for as long as um, several weeks to months. So while it is important to get that second dose, and we will be focusing on doing that, especially in people who are most at risk, we are reassured that delaying that for weeks, even to months, and in the UK and in um, Quebec, they're looking at 90 days or three months for the second dose. We know we have a buffer where we can safely uh, delay the second dose if needed to make sure that our operational issues, that the enough vaccine um, comes to be able to provide those second doses. So that's what we'll be focusing on and we'll be monitoring very carefully so that we can tell if we start to see a decrease in protection effects. The other thing that we have learned, of course, throughout our pandemic here in BC is that the tide can turn quickly and that successes that we have had in getting our transmission down and preventing outbreaks can also be washed away quickly. While the overall number of new cases has slowly been coming down and is lower than it was a few weeks ago, it is still very high in terms, much higher than we want it to be. And we are also once again seeing increases in some regions more than others. Particularly, we've seen cases start to stabilize as, as the uh, outbreaks have been settling down in the interior. We're still having challenging times, of course, in the north in many communities. Um, but on the island as well, things are starting to be managed. But we are very concerned that in some of our higher population areas, particularly in, in the Fraser Health Region and Vancouver Coastal Health Region, we're starting to see an uptick. And what we see in terms of cases today reflects what has happened as, as long as two weeks ago. So what we've started to see in the last week is the seven-day rolling average of numbers of cases has started to creep up, particularly in Fraser Health the percent positive, so the number of cases that we have, of number of people who've been tested and the percent who test positive, and the seven-day rolling average of that also is ticking up, particularly in Fraser Health. And the third thing that we monitor for, um, that we present in our modeling data, is that reproductive number. And we want it to be consistently below one and as far below one as we can get it, because that is our buffer. So that means how many people, on average, is a single case transmitting to? And if it's above one, we know that that means growth can happen very quickly. And in the last week, we started to see this rise above one in some regions of the province, particularly in the Fraser Health region. We know that, that when, um, when we start to have transmission, from multiple people to multiple people, it grows what we call exponentially. So that means if I pass it on to two people, each of them passes it on to two people. Very quickly, we get to four, we get to 16, we get to 256 within two generations. So these are the things that we need to pay attention to now. While the numbers seem like they're reasonable, the fact that we're, we're seeing an increase in the reproductive number means that we're not having those safe interactions as much as we need to be. We need to reduce the transmission events that are happening in our community. 
once we start to see increases, they rise very quickly and then we go back to playing catch up again. Because the long incubation period, two weeks, what we do today affects what's going to happen next week and the week after. So it's often, um, once we start to play catch up, it takes much longer to get the numbers back down. We know it doesn't take much for this spread to get out of control, which is why everything that we do individually makes a difference collectively. If you have symptoms of COVID-19, you must stay home to stay away from others and arrange to get tested. For employers, if people who work for you are ill, you need to support them to stay home. This is important not just on an individual basis, but means that your business is protected as well. This is not just a lower mainland issue, and we've seen this before too, where it starts in the higher population areas, but we know that we still move for various reasons and it can spread widely around the province very quickly. We have to remember that today's new cases are the result of our actions as long as two weeks ago. But what's more important is that what each of us does today is what is going to determine our future. The precautions we take today will define how we fare two weeks from now. And what we do makes a difference. We have seen that even small social gatherings can spread, spread exponentially when people um, go from that small games night that you had together to um, spreading to schools, spreading to workplaces, spreading to other, um, other uh, settings. We need to stay the course with keeping our numbers small, keeping our interactions with others safe. And that means staying away if we're ill, covering our mouth when we cough, keeping our safe distance, wearing our masks and cleaning our hands continuing to follow our public health restrictions and guidance that we have right now is what will lead us into the spring, even as we get our vaccination programs back up and running at full speed once again. So this is a, a week that's near and dear to my heart. It is um, what's known as the Random Act of Kindness Week. And I implore all of you to remember this as we get through this phase of our pandemic together and to remember that kindness is something that is infectious as well. And I remind you all to be kind, to be calm, and to be safe. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. I wanted to start by um, uh, passing on my condolences, those of the Premier, those of uh, government, those of all people in BC, to the families, friends and caregivers of the 26 people who passed away this weekend in this four-day period from COVID-19, 10 from Friday to Saturday, 5 from Saturday to Sunday, 7 from Sunday to Monday, and 4 from Monday to today. This is an extraordinarily difficult time to grieve, and we are thinking of all of you, and you are in our hearts today, and knowing the challenges that this period of pandemic has, has put everybody in to have such a thing occur in your family or in your circle of friends is very difficult indeed. Wanted to note in terms of acute care hospitals that we continue to see um, a fairly stable situation with respect to available beds, about 88.7%, uh, not about 88.7% of uh, beds are currently occupied in the healthcare system with approximately 1,090 available uh, regular beds, base beds. 70.4% if you add our surge bed is in are occupied across the system. That's 3,531 available um, base and surge beds. In ICU, our occupancy rate is 73.5%, which means 141 beds, uh, base beds are available. And 51.7% when you add the surge uh, critical care beds that have been put in place for 367 available beds. I wanted to note um, the continued efforts of the influenza vaccine campaign. As you know, there's little evidence at the moment of community circulation of influenza. However, influenza testing continues at elevated levels. That as of 
uh, February 15th, we know of at least 1.4, 1,455,412 doses of influenza vaccine have been administered to British Columbians. I just want to note of those, 1,062,970 have been delivered by pharmacists, which is an increase from 724,000 for the same period last year. So an increase of approximately 338,000 doses delivered by pharmacists. Pharmacists have played a central role, more so than ever, in our influenza vaccine campaign this year. And we are very appreciative of that role. And we know that pharmacists are going to play a critical role as we deal um, with immunizations in the months to come. I wanted to also note, uh, as Dr. Henry said, that we've that uh, 171,755 doses of influenza have been delivered. Just to put that in context, in terms of um, some important sectors, that's uh, in, amongst long-term care residents. That's 27,483 first doses and 4,057 second doses. In terms of long-term care staff, that's 35,471 first doses and 12,079 second doses. In terms of assisted living staff, that's 9,634 residents, I should say, 9,634 uh, doses and 217 second doses. And amongst assisted living staff, uh, 4,830 uh, first doses and 631 second doses. 4,826 essential visitors in long-term care have also received their first doses, as well as 879 um, people who are effectively in acute care hospitals but waiting for a long-term care bed. So the, that uh, reflected, and if you reflect that against our targets when we went through and as we're in for phase one of our immunization campaign obviously those sectors have been well covered to date and will continue to be their high priority areas and high vulnerability areas i want to note and express my appreciation to all of the teams all of the public health teams the health 30 teams who are working on this immunization campaign it has real uh, fundamental challenges not least of which is, of course, some of the interruptions in what was expected over the last few weeks and some inconsistency in when during a week uh, um, doses arrive, which means sometimes planned immunization clinics have to be canceled. In spite of this, the professionalism of our team, I think, our team has been uh, truly extraordinary and we are appreciative. I want to end by just noting uh, uh, over the weekend I had the occasion to meet with a number of people both in Fraser Health and in Vancouver Coastal Health where we've seen some increase in the number of cases, uh, especially over the last 10 days uh, with healthcare professionals in Fraser Health, with young people in Fraser Health, with healthcare workers in Vancouver Coastal Health this weekend, uh, uh, meeting with them virtually. And I think the message there is clear that uh, while our immunization ca campaign is getting back on track to the extent that we're going to receive more doses later this week from Pfizer, that by the end of March, our expectation is, the plan is, the plan that has been presented to us by the federal government will see about 10 percent of British Columbians immunized. I know we've said this before, but it's important to note that. By April 1st, about 10 percent of the population will be immunized if the vaccines come in as expected. So until millions of British Columbians are vac vaccinated, the percentage that must continue to guide our COVID-19 fight in British Columbia is 100 percent. We have to remain 100 percent committed to stop the spread. That, that we stay 100 percent all in on the effort to use the skills we've been taught, follow the guidance we've been given by Dr. Henry and her team, and obey the public health orders in place to give our vaccines the fighting chance and the greatest chance to build on the work we're doing to keep people safe and save lives. The people delivering our BC immunization plan are counting on us to stay 100 percent committed to stopping the spread, especially right now, especially when we're making progress, particularly in long-term care, especially when people remain nonetheless vulnerable in British Columbia to COVID-19 and indeed its variants. We have to continue to be 100 percent all in on the effort. We know, I know, that it's been a long time. I know we're now on first anniversaries of events in the COVID-19 pandemic because we saw significant activity right here and everywhere in the month of February last year. But now is the time when all of us, all of us have to ensure that we don't let down the people doing the immunization work, but mostly we don't let each other down and allow COVID-19 to relaunch itself in this period, in this important period, as we await 
everyone having the opportunity to be immunized in BC. Aujourd'hui, nous faisons le point sur le nombre de nouveaux cas pour quatre périodes de référence de 24 heures chacune. Il y a eu 26 nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 durant ces périodes de référence. Nous offrons nos condoléances aux familles et aux amis des 1314 personnes décédées du COVID-19 et à tous ceux qui ont perdu des êtres chers au cours de cette pandémie. Pour la première période de référence, nous avons eu 452 nouveaux cas. Pour la deuxième période de référence, nous avons eu 431 nouveaux cas. Pour la troisième période de référence, nous avons eu 348 nouveaux cas. Au cours des dernières 24 heures, 302 nouveaux cas se sont ajoutés. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 231 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, dont 74 en soins intensifs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to everybody on the phone line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You are limited to one question and one follow-up only. I would also ask that you please take your phones off mute. You are not audible until your name is called. First question is from Justine Hunter, Global Mail. Thank you. Um, Dr. Henry, the Chief Justice of the BC Supreme Court on Friday said that BC was putting the courts in, a, in an impossible position in asking for an injunction regarding those church gatherings. I'm wondering, are you planning to amend your order so that police can arrest people for violations? Um, so there's a couple of things in that. One, um, this is before the court, so the, I am I have to be cautious about what I do say. I will say that this injunction uh, was in response to a, 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 a legal challenge, and until that legal challenge was heard, we wanted to make sure um, that people understood that the rules were still in place. Um, Anyway, uh, my uh, uh, my ability to um, uh, under the Public Health Act to add additional um, measures to the orders. Um, I don't think uh, I'm not uh, I'm not aware that I have that authority. Let's put it that way. And we're not talking about arresting people. What we're talking about in terms of detention was preventing people from entering a premise, for example. And so that is something that is under the Emergency Management Act part of the order. So these are all things that the legal folk are working out. Um, but I do think it's important. Um, my understanding is that um, that we need it to, to uh, ensure that people realized that while the court challenge that the church has brought um, was being heard, that these rules still apply, and they apply for the reasons that we've put them in place based on the science and the evidence. When I believe believe there is risk of transmission and where we have seen transmission in these settings, that's where the orders apply. Do you have a follow-up, Justine? I do. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to loop back to the issue of booster shots for vaccines. Uh, roughly 150,000 British Columbians have had their primer shot, if I read that correctly. And I'm wondering if you have an idea of how many people will make it in that 42-day window and how many are likely to miss that window. And I, I heard what you're saying about the 90 days being a possibility, but just in terms of the original target of getting to 42 days. Yeah, you know, obviously our, our original target was to try and do it within, um, you know, 35 days. But, you know, these are operational considerations. And so it depends a little bit on which vaccine people received. So the Pfizer vaccine we're starting to, which we had more of and will have more of, um, most people are still within the, the 42 days, at least starting to, to get second doses at day 42. Um, we have some uh, challenges with Moderna because the, the amount of Moderna, it was coming in every three weeks and the amount that we're getting uh, next week um, is lower than expected. So there will some, be some people, particularly um, who receive the Moderna vaccine, will be delayed for another week. So it's in the range of uh, four to 6,000 people for both that will be uh, started at longer than 42 days. Um, but much depends, of course, on how much Moderna comes in uh, later in March, and we don't have that confirmed yet. 
So it is a very challenging thing. The one thing I am confident of is uh, the, the increasing data that supports that we have a very strong and robust immune response to the first dose that lasts for the short term. And when we're talking short term, it is definitely in, in the uh, longer than six weeks um, and at least out to three months. So I'm not concerned that we're going to decrease our vaccine effectiveness um, I obviously want to protect particularly our most vulnerable people as soon as we possibly can with the best protection we can. Thank you. Next question is from Richard Sussman, Global News. And Dr. Henry, considering how many people in long-term care, both staff and residents, have received the vaccine, how is it even possible that outbreaks are still happening and people in long-term care are still getting sick and dying? Yeah. Um, so uh, the the sad thing is that most of the deaths that we've had in long term care are in outbreaks that started prior to uh, the immunization program starting. And you must remember that we consider a single case of a staff person with an ex potential exposures or a resident as being an outbreak. So we also know that there's a period of time before your body develops enough antibodies to give you protection. And that's about 14 days, somewhere around 14 to 21 days is when your maximum protection starts after receiving the immunization. So what we are seeing right now is the effects that we have not yet passed that, that critical period of time for everybody who's been immunized. But what we aren't seeing is the rapidly spreading outbreaks that we saw earlier on in November and, and into December prior to immunization. So, you know, the protection that we're seeing is very robust after people have, their bodies have that opportunity to develop the, the response. So that takes a few weeks and uh, it's, uh, it's still building building up, um, but we're getting there. Richard, do you have a follow-up? Richard, are you there? I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. Go ahead. Uh, the, outbreak, the outbreak at the George Derby Centre uh, is still happening. It started, uh, as you alluded to, some have started before the vaccination started, but how are we still seeing an outbreak in this facility? How has it gone on so long? And would uh, rapid testing or uh, PCR testing for staff not uh, be advisable at this time to help deal with this ongoing outbreak? Yeah, so uh, it is the most challenging outbreak that we have, and, and sadly, the, the the number of people who've who've died from COVID-19 has been very high in, in George Derby, and it's been exhausting and challenging for the families, for the caregivers, and for the residents in that facility. And unfortunately, it, the virus was quite widespread before immunization became available. In terms of testing, uh, you know, obviously in an outbreak, PCR, the more accurate testing is what we do, and it has been done regularly uh, of staff and residents in George Derby, as we do with every outbreak. So there's, uh, um, you know, the, when we have an outbreak, when we know that there's a higher probability of people having the virus, whether they're symptomatic or not, we do systematic testing um, on a repeated basis with the PCR testing with the rapid turnaround time. So that is being done, is being done in all of our long-term care outbreaks. Catherine, <clears throat> Catherine Garrett, my PG now. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. Um, the WHO has been given the go-ahead by health officials on the prairies and south of the border in the Pacific Northwest to start their season. When do you anticipate BC to be given the green light and what's been the delay on that? I'm sorry, the WHO to start what? WHO. Oh, sorry, uh, the WHO, Western Hockey League. Joe, <laughs> okay, the Western Hockey League. I, I have not received uh, an updated uh, proposal from them in the last few weeks. So, you know, we, as I've said before, we're happy to, to look at that. And I hope that if we continue on the trajectory we are, that we'll be able to salvage a season uh, come March or, or April. Follow up, Catherine? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Next question is from Shannon Patterson, CTV.
from both Dr. Henry and Minister Dix. Washington state has already administered over a million vaccine doses, and we're only at 171,000. In the U.S., they expect to make the vaccine available to everyone by April or May, and Canada saying by September. So can you understand the frustration British Columbians feel when we see our neighbors just over the border in Washington state get vaccinated much sooner with a promise to return to normal by the spring? Do you share that frustration that Canada has not been able to secure as much vaccine as other countries, thereby delaying our recovery? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if you can read frustration in my face, but of course we do. Um, you know, we, we, it is what, we, what it is. It doesn't make vaccine come any quicker to be upset or angry or mad about it. Um, we're dealing the hand that, uh, we're playing the hand we were dealt, and we are committed to getting immunizations as fast into people's arms to protect people as we receive them. And we've been doing that very effectively so far. We uh, now are very hopeful that once we've uh, started to get supply on a regular basis and Pfizer has committed to giving us uh, increased doses between now and the end of March, we're also hopefully going to also receive uh, increased doses uh, from Moderna. And we know that there's uh, more vaccine on the horizon. So come April, uh, we understand that the uh, shipments we're receiving from uh, both of those uh, vaccines will be increasing and moved up from where uh, they were initially thought to um, to be received, so from quarter three to quarter two, per, where we are expecting. Um, I, I qualify everything because, as we know, with a large global production like this, there's always snags, whether it's the weather, whether it's the production facility, whether it's access to uh, the supplies that we need, uh, the low dead space syringes, for example. So these are all moving parts that are changing rapidly, and we're trying to adapt as best we can. We will be um, starting our our mass vaccination clinics for our, our elders and seniors um, starting in March and for um, most of us starting in April. So we'll do what we can with as much vaccine as we receive as soon as we get it. And that's what we're planning for and continue to plan for. I mean, the short answer is, of course, yes. It, it would be desirable to get more vaccine uh, every day. Every person that gets vaccinated in BC makes everyone else safer in BC. So uh, we'd like to have more. And as you can tell, the vaccine that we have received, we've delivered into people's arms. And uh, the results in long term care have meant that since January 15th, we've gone from 49 long term care assisted living independent living outbreaks to, I believe, 15 today. So that sign- shows how effective uh, the vaccine can be and where we have seen and continue to see new outbreaks, they've been uh, among small numbers of people. So we know the vaccine is effective. We'd like to see more of it. Some of the reasons why there isn't domestic capacity uh, to produce vaccines in Canada are well known. There's a debate about that from our past. The past decisions that were made uh, about this have affected us now. There's no question about that. But as Dr. Henry has said, we have to deal with the situation in front of us and simply complaining about it is not sufficient. Although, let's be clear, we have to make sure, I think, as a country and Canada at the national level has to make sure that uh, that this situation is dealt with in the future. But for right now, we have to take the vaccine we can and deliver it in the most effective possible way to protect the most vulnerable first and then everybody else. Would we like to have more doses? Absolutely. Every single day, we think we'd like to have more doses, every week and every month. But we are dealing with those that we have, and I think the folks doing the campaign on the ground who are delivering, especially have delivered immunization in healthcare facilities, are doing an extraordinary job, and we have to recognize their work. Follow up, Shannon? Yeah, for, for Dr. Henry, the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations is recommending that racialized Canadians disproportionately affected by COVID-19 and essential workers who can't work virtually be put in priority two for vaccines. Is BC considering changing its plan to accommodate this? 
No, uh, yes and no. Um, these are important considerations. We've had ongoing discussions with NASI and with uh, my colleagues across the country. And I think it, it, what they're trying to reflect, which we absolutely agree with, is that some populations are differentially affected by COVID and by the measures that we've put in place to deal with it. And many of them come from racialized communities where access to health services is less um, than others, where uh, work Workplaces may be uh, less um, able to support people, so lower wage uh, places where you may not have a sick leave, for example, and we know that that's a, an impact on communities around BC as well. So what we are, are focusing on is making sure that we can monitor who's uh, being immunized and, and uh, address those, um, those populations who uh, are not equally accessing vaccine at the same time. So if we look at uh, the, our priority population or people in the community over age 80, and we will be monitoring to see if we're um, getting people from all communities over age 80 to receive vaccine and doing special targeted programs if we are finding that some communities are falling off or are not accessing vaccines because of the way our, our system is set up. So that is something we're very mindful of and we will be um, considering. I will also say that you know, when we look at some of the populations we're talking about, some of the people we're talking about, um, many of them work in our health care system, our care aides and the, the, the staff who work in long-term care homes, many of them belong to racialized communities who are differentially affected. So making sure that we meet their needs, answer their questions, make sure that people are comfortable and understand um, the implications of receiving vaccine and do it in a way that's safe for them is a top priority for us. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. They're not um, a separate group. What we're trying to do is ensure with every priority population that receives immunization that we're doing it in a way that's that increases equity. It's challenging, of course, but we'll be continuing to monitor that carefully. Um, the one other thing I will say is, uh, you know, we have other vaccines that are on the horizon. Uh, AstraZeneca is in for a review, as is Novavax and Johnson and Johnson vaccines. And these are all ones that are much easier to use in that they're fridge stable. So we can target um, people who aren't able to work from home, um, people who are essential workers, whether it's police or or uh, fire services or education workers, or people who work in our grocery stores and, and other places. So we are very um, conscious of that as well and are looking at how we can target populations to bring everybody's immunization up um, as we receive vaccine. But of course, none of those are approved for use yet in Canada. Next question is from Marcella Bernardo, News 1130. Thank you, everyone. Um, Dr. Henry, I was hoping to ask you that with, you, you touched on this a bit today, but with dozens more school exposures reported in recent days, how concerned are you that public safety orders are not being followed by families that are still allowing sleepovers in their homes or teenagers hosting Super Bowl parties, further increasing the risk of this virus spreading inside a school environment? Yeah, and, and you know these are the things that uh, that we are concerned about. Particularly, we know in the Fraser Health region in Vancouver Coastal, the Lower Mainland, um, but also other places that we are seeing um, exposures that are happening. About forty percent of them, from what we're seeing, are from social gatherings. Social gatherings that sh should not be happening right now. This is what the message we're trying to put out there. It has implications, even though you think that you're not at risk or your family's not at risk. We know that uh, uh, that these types of events, uh, we know of a games night where there was 50 people in an establishment that should not have been having a games night and that 15 people from that, um, that event which um, is against orders, uh, became infected and spread to several workplaces, to schools, and to a child care centre. So these things are what we all need to hold each other to account. You know, we in public health cannot be in everywhere. We can't be in every um, pub or restaurant or business or um, every place all at the same time. We need to hold each other accountable right now for stopping 
the spread because that's what's going to get us into the spring where we have enough vaccine to protect people. And the, the what we're seeing in schools right now reflects the transmission that we're seeing in our families and our communities. Follow up, Marcella. I'm kind of sorry that I have to ask this next question, but it is um, about an owner of a local comedy club that says British Columbians could use a laugh more than ever right now, and if restaurants and bars are allowed to operate, so should comedy clubs. So if venues like comedy clubs and theatres updated their COVID safety plans, how soon do you think you could consider letting them reopen? You know, there's there's things that are... <laughs> that there. The short answer is, right now, we're still seeing too much transmission. And no, I absolutely agree. We could all use a laugh. We can all use some joy in our life every day. But it doesn't mean we have to go to a comedy club. And we have seen where people think they're doing OK, and it's just a little bit of a, a, a stretch, and we're not really breaking the rules too much that we see spread of this virus and it gets into our communities and it gets transmitted in workplaces, it gets transmitted in schools, we see people ending up in hospital and we see the effects of that. So now is not the time to be increasing our social interactions and social gatherings and it's not the time for those types of events. April Lawrence, Check News. Oh, hi, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Henry, with Due to outbreaks at Nanaimo long-term care homes, uh, families there are pushing to know whether the all staff members in the facilities that are working closely with patients, um, whether they've been vaccinated. And I realize there's issues around privacy, but they that they have a right to know. Um, and if they haven't all been vaccinated, can you tell us why? Yeah, so we'll be presenting some data on that on Friday. Um, we have collected that uh, staff immunization rates by um, by facility, so you'll know. Um, nobody has a right to know an individual's immunization status, um, and that's something that's important for all of us in terms of our own protection. And I will say with these vaccines that we have, it is also important to know that direct protection of seniors and elders with vaccination than themselves is very effective. So unlike influenza, for example, where vaccinating in a ring around people is so, so important because we don't uh, mount as good an immune response as we get older, um, that is not the case with these new vaccines, which is really why I'm so excited about them. They work well in older people themselves. That's you know miraculous in, in many ways. So while it is still important and we will be targeting, there's very few, but there are a few um, care homes where not everybody, uh, not all the staff uh, are immunized. And what we need to do is make sure we understand why and we uh, give more opportunities for people to receive the vaccine and receive the information they need to be comfortable receiving the vaccine. That's so, so important, especially with these new vaccines. So that is something that uh, we'll be following up on. Uh, but still you know we know that one or two cases can happen even when everybody's been immunized Follow up, April? yeah thank you um and i know you've been talking about the shortage of vaccine but i was wondering if you could tell me um when second doses might be rolled out in these two particular facilities and whether you're giving any priority for those second doses to long-term care homes that are experiencing an outbreak yeah, so we did initial immunizations in uh, care homes that were experiencing outbreaks as a way of protecting the second generation um, as best we could, not always successfully depending on the timing. Um, but yes, um, the, the residents in particular of care homes are um, people that we want to get the second dose in uh, in this timely way as we can. Uh, some of the care homes that were done later are not yet at the minimum period, so uh, that's something to consider as well. Um, but we are looking at, it, it's less important for younger people, um, more important for us to protect uh, older people as uh, quickly as we can. And, and just uh, April, that's already started. I think I reported earlier, but just important to note about 63,000 uh, long-term care residents and staff 
um, have been immunized. About 16,000 have already received their second dose, so that process is on the way. 4,826 essential visitors as well. And uh, many people were sometimes referred to as ALC um, uh, patients in acute care hospitals have also been immunized. So we're well on the way there and in many care homes well on the way for a second dose. And so the detailed information per care home uh, for residents will be provided uh, on Thursday, I believe, or Thursday and, and Friday. And, and we'll put that information out for everyone to see. But I think it's pretty... Um, uniformly high across health authorities and pretty uni uniformly high both amongst residents and staff and the sheer numbers. Our target, our total target in BC for long-term care staff was initially 37,000, is now 39,000 and obviously there's approximately 30,000 residents in long-term care so you can see uh, the extent of the immunization across the province. We have time for one more question. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a statement this afternoon with the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca. For updated province-wide restrictions, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID restrictions. And for information about the province's orders and pandemic supports, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question is from Zara Premji, CBC. Are you there, Zara? Okay, we will move on to Dominique Levesque, CBC Radio Canada. <laughs> Dominique, are you there? Okay, one more try. Camille Baines, Canadian Press. <laughs> Henry, regarding the viruses of concern, what percentage of COVID positive samples are being uh, sequenced right now? And do we have capacity to scale that up if necessary? Uh, yes. Um, the short answer is yes. I, uh, in terms of scaling it up, what, we're, what we've developed or what the lab has developed is a, um, a marker, a SNP marker. So it's one of the ones that you can do all of the positive tests. You include it with the PC, as part of the PCR testing. Um, and we did uh, what we call a point prevalence uh, over five days. So they did 3,099 uh, positive samples that were collected between January. So all of the samples that were positive between January 30th and February 5th. Um, and of those, we found only three uh, were confirmed to be variants of concern with whole genome sequencing. So that process continues. I, I don't actually know the percent we're doing on a daily basis, um, but uh, I know we're uh, doing the marker and trying to get up to doing um, as many uh, of if not all of the positives with at least the screening test and then uh, uh, doing uh, samples of, of the whole genome sequencing. Overall, we've done about 10% of the genomes that we've uh, isolated in BC with whole genome sequencing. Camille, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, what's known, and I know it's early, but so far what's known about the variant uh, first identified in Nigeria and um, What's your concern about it, considering since you mentioned it, mentioned one our, one of our cases or the only one last Friday, um, there have been more cases of it in the UK and elsewhere. So what's your concern about it? Yeah, so one of the things that the uh, the lab folk um, look at is, is there something about the mutation that gives the that strain of the virus or that variant um, increased ability to transmit, cause more severe disease or be more virulent, or um, interfere with the ability of tests to pick it up or the vaccine to work. So those are, are things that now have been associated with a couple of different known mutations. One of the ones that seems to be the most concerning is about transmission and increased transmissibility has been linked with a variant that's called 501Y. Um, so this uh, one that we picked up um, 
535 uh, is uh, does not have the the 501Y mutation, but it has a num uh, couple of others that are, and I don't have it in front of me written down, but there's a couple of other variant uh, mutations that are also seen in things like the uh, variant we saw from the UK, the 117, um, that uh, may be linked with increased transmissibility. So we've seen lots of, of different slight mutations in the viruses that we found uh, here in BC and across the country, but not all of them give the, the virus any advantage that makes it more likely to sort of take over. Um, but there's some that are, and, and one of the mutations that this uh, variant that was originally associated with Nigeria has is one that is of concern. So that's why they'd, uh, the, our lab folk have decided to, to include it in the ones that we monitor for. That's all the time we have for questions. Thank you. Thank you.